Okay, so let's uh, fire away. I think first of all, Megan, just quickly, if you can introduce yourself, what you do and stuff, because we know Charles and Ryan and so forth, so cool. appreciate that. Thanks, Jacques. Jacques yeah. could be on the panel this morning, so I haven't heard much, but um, so I, at the moment, wear two hats. Um, so I, training in evolutionary biology, actually, went into data science in 2012, so quite a long time ago. Started a company called Ixio. We've done a lot of really cool machine learning type solutions for banks, insurance companies. Um, we work across the continent. Um, and I'm wearing another hat here today, and I'd like to kind of talk about it a little bit. But from what we've seen in like data science and working as consultants mostly across the continent is that there's this, this kind of view that Africans don't have the skills to solve the problems. Um, and there's still a view that you know you need to bring in consultants from Europe and America and to do this kind of work. Like it's over the years, we've kind of, uh, we're in contact with all these amazing AI and machine learning communities across the continent. And so we decided to take some of our profits and create a new startup. And it's called Zindi. Um, and it's a competition platform for AI and machine learning problems. Um, and it's really about empowering Africans to solve problems and to, to kind of change this mindset to show that you know we have the skills and the abilities. Um, but obviously, you know, we want the best solutions to and to solve African problems. We really want to look at you know, solving challenges that we have on this kind of continent. Um, and that are quite different from you know, problems that you might encounter in America and Europe and things like that in China. So that's what I do, yeah. Um, awesome. Yeah, and, and we're actually going to have a discussion afterwards around, because it fits in with the Machine Intelligence of Africa, helping to transform Africa, and it's building a community around data science and AI machine learning. Um, and to, to create a kind of a kaggle for Africa, I think that's a fantastic idea. So let's explore. I'm looking forward to that. That's exactly what we want to do. And I think as you think about opportunities and pitfalls of machine learning and what we can do as a community, as Africans here as well, those, this is the kind of stuff to make it work. So we need visionary leadership and we need execution around those type of things. Okay, so I think um, we had some really thoughtful discussions, Ryan, you as well and Charles um, and I like about that because you need to look at the big picture where things are going as well so um, and you know think about the future of work as well so maybe let's just talk about that a little bit I want to get into um, other things as well and I also want to say let's open it up to if you've got a you feel you want to ask something please do um, just raise your hand and we'll we'll address those questions as well so we keep it very interactive we want to get the most out of this. So I'm going to lead with some questions. And I want to actually say, if you think about very specific things as well, so I'm going to drive a few things. But if there's things that you want to raise and to the, well, you want to point to the channel, let's do that as well. And Selena, I know you've got a bunch of ideas and questions as well. So and Michael, you as well. So let's, let's, uh, let's keep it very interactive. It's like a group discussion. We're sitting here, but it's, let's talk. Um, so I think you've already alluded to that in, in, in your um, you talk, but if you think about, the, we want to maybe start with opportunities. We need to talk about the pitfalls as well. Um, as well, I think around their privacy and bias, and I think we need, we need to talk through that because that's a practical reality. Um, regulation. As a matter of fact, next month uh, in Geneva, Switzerland, um, I've been invited to another conference that talks about AI regulation policies and stuff, and that's going to be awesome just to, to hear more about uh, that as well. So I think we need to talk about that as well. That part. But let's just talk about from opportunities, um, maybe the future of work is actually is opportunities and pitfalls. We do it wrong, and we're going to mess up. And what does it mean for, so maybe like it's real, um, if we need to give advice to Cyril and Pauza with the government around these type of things, what, what would be your suggestions? And I think let's talk about it. What, what would be practical things that we can do around given scenarios that are in, in Africa, South Africa and Africa? Um, the skill set, the, the, the infrastructure issues. Um, how, do you, how do you think about those type of things? Because we know what we left behind, and you've got all these billions of dollars being pumped into well, uh, from from a government in China and France. They make it a national strategy. Um, and uh, what do we do as Africans, um, and specifically in terms of the future of work? And what does it mean? Maybe so South Africa is starting with. How do you think about it? It's a loaded question, but <laughs> yes, I'm, I'm, again, I'm quite an optimist just in terms of what if we can. Uh, we have to be strategically wise in the way we approach our technology, because right? we can get so wrapped up in this technology and can do so much for us. 
But if we don't think through the applications in the right way, I think we're going to, we're going to shoot ourselves in the foot. So I, I just go back to what is, in South Africa, what are, what are our differentiators? Um, if I just look at the human capital space, I think our education system is an absolute unmitigated disaster. Um, and we are, we are continuing to pour money into a broken system. So one of our massive challenges for, for government, and I don't believe government will solve this, simply because it's politically not um, um, a good idea to, to start pushing buttons, is we should be fundamentally breaking down the entire education system that we currently have. It is a, it is a waste of money. Um, and that we should be asking our children to, do, to learn in a fundamentally different way. And the reason I say that is because um, my child, for example, is at a private school. She's still, I, I said this, she's still learning um, parts of history where she has to replicate a date to, put, to get a, 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 a pass. I said to her, please fail this test. I'm actually, I'm actually, just wow, that's it, because it actually is irrelevant. What I want to ask of you is what, what insights have you got out of that particular issue that can apply to the future? That's all I want you to think around. If I ask you to memorize, fail it, because I, I and you've got my blessing. Um, the it's challenge is, subject. that's the one. That's the you know? um, now I look down downstream, and, and you've got teachers who are who live on paternalism. They, they breed of paternalism, so they want to control the message, they want to control the children, and, and actually, if we carry on with this model, we are having people that have had 12 years of investing in a coding mechanism that, that fits them at that risk. So, so for me, if, just to start off with, we have to fundamentally rethink our human coding and social coding systems and unlock people. So we have to turn it on its head. If we can do that bravely, um, I believe we could, we could transform this country very quickly. Yeah. My gut, though, is that um, we are, the, the, the government is a controlling mechanism and all the systems are too compromised to allow this. So it almost ends up with a revolution construct and, and that's unfortunately what, what, what happens. Okay. Um, can I just respond a little bit? I, I mean, I agree um, on the point that the education system in South Africa is uh, not functioning uh, very well. Um, I'm not convinced that um, a revolutionary approach towards education is the right way to go. Um, I think one of the, the, there are a lot of politicized issues within education in South Africa. I think education in, generally, in general in South Africa has never been approached in a um, uh, evidence-based way. It's largely been approached from uh, dogma. So, and, and that maybe goes to this road learning. Um, but, but I think there, there's a danger in trying to um, shift off to the right um, and not actually take a, a carefully considered um, uh, approach to that. And I think we've seen that already in the 2005 curriculum that came through. That was a sudden shift and it was a disaster. That was basically emulating what, what was the current best thinking in education globally, but didn't take into that. And actually has been shown to not function globally either. So, if you look at how China is approaching this, how India is approaching this, they're focusing on quite traditional um, maths and science skills. I would think that that would be a very good place to, to start. Obviously, we need to think 30 years down the line. So if you listen to someone like Jack Ma, he's saying, well, we shouldn't be educating kids. I think this is similar to what you're saying, right? We shouldn't be educating kids um, in areas that AI will be, um, will be better than them at. We should be looking at things like arts and uh, cultural values. Um, I mean, maybe that's true. I would think that ideally we want to be educating them in a way that they can work with machines and with AI, and that's basically the, the space. And I, I do think that that requires a certain element of um, you know, STEM training, science, technology, engineering, and maths. If I can just jump in, so I think if you apply it into our world of data scientists and skills and that, you know, a lot of guys have like come through STEM programs and done data science courses and things like that. That doesn't make them a good data scientist in a business. And that's the kind of like, you know, the irritation we get from clients is like, oh, help, I've hired all these people who are so smart, they're not helping me solve my problems. And it's because they can't ask the difficult questions, they can't identify challenges to solve. So, so it's like, it'll give you a good foundation. Mm. It's certainly not the, not, not the, the final answer. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, no, I mean, I agree with that. I think what, what, what I see at the moment is people coming out of the education system, 
that are not um, uh, able to communicate in a um, quantitative way. Um, <coughs> I think it, it was actually, if you think about the, the 16th, 21st century uh, skills, um, dealing with changing environments, dealing with complex environments, was identified. And, and there's, there's critical thinking and all of that, that's part of that and stuff. And all that. I think even the World Climate Forum and the United Nations, all these, all that, that's what the act is as well. But I mean, it's how do you make it real and practical mm -hmm. for our education system? Well, that's, that's, that's a challenge. Um, anyway, okay, that's good. So let's, um, please, if you've got questions, most welcome as well. Um, just Let's just talk about some of the pitfalls as well. So we just cover both ends. Um, if you think about um, bias, um, and obviously, uh, we, you guys alluded to some of the controls specifically, but let's just, what are the things that we need to look out for um, that you want to highlight um, specifically? So, I don't know, but at least think about it, even from what you are implementing with, you, you're trying to address a very specific thing, but, but if you think about AI machine learning more generally, what, what are the, the pitfalls that you specifically um, in the application of AI, so, so, yeah. so we're assuming we, we're automating stuff now, and, yeah. it, and these systems are going to have a dramatic impact um, on society and stuff. So it, it's really about, uh, it's one thing to, to shape and say how do we use this and how do we adapt. Clearly we have to, but, but humans, we're also architects of this automation and stuff. So in terms of that, I mean, what, what do you see? So our, our business is about building a, a digital brain for a company. So what we'll do is we'll build a digital brain that a chatbot and a, a human interface can tap into to get a prescriptive outcome. So for example, if it's in a contact center, uh, we know exactly every call journey uh, that you need to follow. We can navigate you through that. In sales, we can navigate you through that. In all the operational decisions, we can navigate you through that. So your job is not actually to know it, and both digital front ends and human front ends can tap into the same digital brain. So that's what we do. Uh, the challenge with that is that uh, once you've got that working, um, so it's prescriptive, it's accurate, it's repetitive, it's compliant, now you have to change the organizational systems to, to say, well, if my human beings, that, that interface is, is not predominantly spending its time doing what we've been asking it to do, how do we reprogram those? How do we re reprogram their jobs? How do we move people in terms of the way they can fundamentally change from here to here rapidly. So we are finding that, that leadership are struggling with the understanding of a human organizational system. The, the, uh, the text there, we can get you to ask the right questions, we can sort your first core resolutions out, all of that, we can get it done. How do you now readjust the, the, the organizational system that has been geared to doing that work historically? That's for me what has proven the most challenging is that a lot of the execs are totally excited about this full automation. They put a, a little um, uh, sort of innovation hub on the side and they want to literally go and create a, a digital version of the other. And they're, they're almost the old bank, new bank construct. And then what happens is that this never actually gets anywhere because it's not, it's not part of the core. And, but they're too scared then to embed this into their current because it's a, it's a transformational change. It takes leadership, it takes visionary in terms of that human system. And, it's, and, and they're not ready for it. So that's my experience right now, is, is leadership is, is, is not ready to actually embed this into and, and disrupt their current world. They yeah. almost want another world to I, disrupt I, I, I can, I, I've seen exactly the same kind of thing, so I agree fully with that. And it's really on multiple levels, so, but it starts there. Well, that's why if you look at the five pillars of big data analytics maturity, I think I just briefly alluded to that. One of them is intent, strategy. And, and the vision and leadership is a critical part. But then there's others as well. You need to look at your data, technology, people, the processes. So all those five things. The IDC and industrial data corporation, those are the things that they, they call it a maturity landscape. And I'm using that as well when, when I guide uh, companies in terms of becoming more AI driven, data driven, um, and, and on the path of smart digital transformation. Um, it, I think it's very important to look at that. And it starts there, that's a, that's a problem, that's a, that's a bottleneck. Um, Anyway, so I want to give you, maybe you've, you've done quite a bit of work um, in marketing and all of those type of things as well. Yeah. What is your experience? Yeah, I mean, I can give you some case studies from that. I think that's, I think that's like, there's, the pitfall would be the danger of like AI leading to things that are more exclusive and kind of cutting people out. There's a danger of that. There's also an opportunity where you can use the AI to be more inclusive. And I think that like some of our like, very early case studies with clients was um, you know, in South Africa, is they were like, using race and things like that to decide who they did certain things with. Um, and we changed that around, you know, we tried to change the thinking around to say, like, let's not use that at all. Um, let's rather look at patterns of behavior of people, you know, so, so you have the opportunity to be 
yeah, so my work is more like customers and things like that, but um, I think it's, you know, as the person creating those models, like you really have to be, you have to ask those kinds of ethical questions, you've got to say, you know, what is the outcome of this, and, and if it's going to be more exclusive, do I really want to be building that, you know, I think that's what I have to start asking. Yeah, that's right, that's, that's part of that architecting solutions and stuff, it's a big responsibility um, from the AI companies as well to, to do it right, and if you think about the top AI, well, if you think about the top tech, the biggest companies in the world, they're all vying for the AI throne. Um, you've got governments, you've got those kind of companies, so there's a massive responsibility. So it's very interesting, Bill, this whole, I don't know if you've watched this, the hearing on Facebook, um, it was fascinating how he was kind of, uh, uh, all those questions, he was peppered with all sorts of interesting questions, some questions that was, anyway, there were some good questions um, as well. And, and it's important things to answer, and he wasn't able to answer that everything in a proper way as well. So, it's, but it's very important, and it affects their business models and all of that. So, it's, it's a very. But I think uh, our companies here in Africa and Africa as well. I think we've got an important role to play. To it's great to hear that. But Charles, you are into this the whole data science space. We also think about the social implications of all of that. So I'm sure you've got. Yeah, I mean, I, I, so, so just thinking about the Facebook. Hearings. One of the um, areas that I'm concerned about is that you end up with these large companies that hold very um, uh, sensitive and important data, and they haven't been elected by anybody. They haven't participated in any kind of democratic process. Um, is that right or is that wrong? And uh, you know, traditionally, what seems to have happened with large conglomerates is that they end up getting broken down. You can see this. In Railway companies in the U.S. and traditionally that's what happened. I'm not sure how that's going to work with um, you know, going back to the data regulations. That that answer needs to be um, participated in a democratic way. Um, and I, I think what complicates this is a little bit what what Ryan alluded to is that um, we, these systems actually create these echo chambers within themselves. So and you see this coming up in election results. Um, and that, I think, is going to feed back into the democratic process. So it's a, it's a complicated social question, actually, as how do these, um, how does data ownership thereof start in, uh, impacting on um, our, or at least the democratic system's ability to actually function and feed back in and on. Just to maybe comment a little bit on that. Comment and then, Apologies, sorry. No, it's fine. <coughs> I've talking a lot, so. But I, I think for me, one of the one of the areas I'm concerned a little bit about is that there are there are human um, psychological weaknesses. We're alluding to those those um, triggers that we can be set off. So Facebook's playing to all of that. They've got you know deep psychology in their technology, and it is largely manipulative. It, 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 actually, they know exactly how human being psychology is working, and they're playing on the triggers and the reinforcements, etc. Concern I I have is that. Is that those are then played played on for um, for purposes that are not uh, in in, people, in society's benefit or the individual's benefit, and that these and, and because the patterns can start moving and reinforce, it actually can become quite manipulative. And and, uh, and I think that's a huge journey we've got to go on. It's how does how does the human um, mind engage with this technology that is knowing it better and better, and then is shaping it quicker and quicker. And then who's in charge? And I think that that's going to be a real journey for all of us: is is understanding, learning about understanding ourselves better. We actually, many of our, <coughs> myself included, have got no understanding of ourselves, and so we have no real understanding of what this technology is doing to us. And I think part of part of our journey is a far better realization of self, so that we can engage with this technology and not allow it to play on triggers that we completely in our subconscious we're not even aware of. I think where it becomes very dangerous, you think about well, in China, if you've got a government that's controlling its citizens, okay. yeah. that, that is a scary scenario, very scary. That's for me not part of a better future. So I'm very scared. And I think it was quite interesting if you, if you listen to the US Congress, the, the AI hearings, um, that op the, the partnership on open AI, open AI, sorry, the partnership on AI there, open AI was represented, there was a bunch of others as well. Um, and they were raising these kind of concerns because in the US that's, that's completely different to the, the values and things that are there as well. So and you want to shape, and obviously the US has got a such important role, leadership role in terms of this. So they've got currently the biggest companies in the world, the biggest AI 
AI companies as well. Um, and they can help shape a better future, set the agenda. So, but there's a big concern uh, that the, the technologies will be misused. And, and we're obviously going to be still talking about other things like weaponized AI and regulation. We're going to talk about regulation, we're going to talk, talk about privacy and stuff like that. But I want to give that gentleman a quick question. Maybe introduce yourself as well. Yes. Uh, yes, sure. Uh, yeah. Stephen Hall. Um, Stephen. I'm a, a technologist, so yeah. uh, I'm interested in, in uh, or coming uh, this, this uh, subject from that uh, viewpoint. But um, my question, I suppose, follows on from, from the, 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 the uh, discussion about Facebook and control of data and that sort of thing. And being somebody who's kind of hands on with technology, a concern which I have, particularly uh, you know, thinking about us uh, sitting here in South Africa and so on, is the fact that there are these large, huge global players who are, if you, if you like, moved down one layer below the Facebook and the data, who actually control the infrastructure. I'm, I'm talking about the Googles, the Amazons, the Microsofts and so on, who are building these massive clouds and deploying uh, AI tools and components and so on. And they're all, there's this tremendous race going on at the moment to be the, the claim uh, territory and so on. Um, and these things are all physically residing somewhere else in the world. They're controlled by someone else. Uh, what are the implications, um, this is my question, what are the implications for us here? Are we always going to be dependent on something deployed, hosted elsewhere, developed elsewhere? How, to what extent can we uh, create our own? Is it realistic? Uh, that's, a, that's an awesome question, and we are actively doing things about this. And I think what, what we are talking about, the African data sets, is, is one area as well. But, but from a cortex logic side, what we are specifically also looking at is if you look at the healthcare space, that uh, the government don't want, well, in general, they don't want the data to be hosted somewhere else. It needs to be kept here. Um, about the African genome, there's great opportunities. So it's actually discussions now with the South African Medical Research Council, universities, um, you know, big hospitals, um, and where we're looking at um, hosting it here. And obviously Azure and Amazon is coming, they're gonna have data centers here, which is gonna be great, we're looking forward to that. Uh, we're working with Microsoft specifically also on uh, all part of this discussion, discussions as well. Um, so I think, it's in the works to, um, to to create host data here, and then we can create our own analytics. And then the African genome is very valuable as well. And then we can monetize that as well um, from here, and, and we can control things better uh, and make sure that all the stakeholders here can benefit from that. But so uh, the good thing is there are active discussions around these kind of things. But the fact of the matter is you've got still the Facebooks. Uh, well, those guys is very influential. If I think about NASPARIS, will they struggling? Well, a lot of these local Think about advertising, Google and Facebook, they're controlling uh, advertising. So how do you counter that uh, as well? It's not easy. Yes, Nick, go for it. So, uh, I'm Nick Bradshaw, I'm the director at AI Expo. Um, one, of the, one of the debates that we had at the uh, Deep Learning X event was yes. around ethics yes. uh, in, in AI. And um, one of the conversations was very much around that we've all been exposed to manipulative yeah. information, proprietors, newspapers, uh, I spent seven months in the UK last year, and countries turned into this polarised group of people who were conflagrating history because of the manipulation around Brexit, and now yeah. they all voted to get out of Europe because of it. Yeah. Yeah. So I think it was a post in LinkedIn yeah. the other week where maybe we can turn this technology around, where rather than being a, a human editor that's um, deciding what we read, what we see on the television, um, that we have a uh, an authentication, a blockchain of information where a source is known, it's proven, it's traced it's there, it's traceable, and therefore the news that we get is real. Yep. And then it's not fake anymore. So yep. a blockchain television driven channel, or radio channel, or whatever it is, so that what you hear is real. Yep. And I think that question around infrastructure, maybe the editors of what we sort of hear and see are no longer newspapers, and they're going to be the people owning the infrastructure because they can decide on what goes in and what comes out. So, how, how do you how do you do that? And I think the yeah. blockchain. Yeah. I think you mentioned earlier on yeah. AI doesn't sit on its own. You've got Absolutely. blockchain, IoT, data source, smart data technologies. Yep. The whole thing comes together. Yeah. But if we can authenticate the information and it's there for everyone to see, so who's your source? That yeah. of course the newspapers say <coughs> we can't tell you that. Yep. But 
Now I can go and see who that source is, and it's right. there. And okay, yeah. they might their name might be redacted because of yeah. you know, protection and safety, but at least you know that that's where that information comes from. So I think I don't know, just something to throw back because it's a it's quite a big debate. Right. No, right. It, that's awesome. Yes. That's <laughs> And um, one other thing about um, even if you could identify what's true, the fact that people don't care. So Trump has proved mm -hmm. like yeah. nobody cares. Yeah, it's unbelievable. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's let's tackle that. There's, I think there's a few things that I uh, that I also wanted to talk about. So I want to give an opportunity just to the panel to respond to that. So let's just talk about traceability, truth, um, fake. Uh, how do we, how do we counter that, and what do we do? With it? So let's talk about that. I want to also talk about that privacy as well. Um, yeah, so let's cover that. So what do you guys think? So I, I, I yeah. can probably uh, yeah. comment on it. Uh, yeah. and the rest I went I went yeah. on what you're saying. But I think for me, the, it's just an, an illustration of the, the stress the societies are under. And if we, we've passed our ability to cope with this level of change. So we are just becoming very, you know, we, we're driving our decision making absolutely on the on our lower brain models, we really are not thinking uh, at all as society, and, and it's a, I think we're at quite a risk uh, level in terms of the ability to move opinions uh, quite quickly. I think my gut is that over a, over a, the next couple of decades, we are going to, we hopefully will see an emergence of a greater consciousness in society where we will actually start being forced to ask systemic questions. We started, we're going to see the implications of a decision I made and the ripple effects. Um, and I think my hope for, for the human species in an optimistic space is that we actually do start engaging far more in terms of the, the consciousness simply due to the, the consequences of us operating currently at these stress levels. Um, my gut though is that over the next period we are going to see more of it. Um, actually more manipulation, more uh, non-rational decision making, um, and, and almost bizarre decision making, simply because our systems are under threat, people are going to start losing more jobs. Uh, as the shift happens, we're going to have to start realigning. That whole stress system, I think, is going to create um, uh, a far more extremism, far more simplistic behavior. And then there's going to come a tipping point where we're actually going to have to start moving into a new consciousness. And I don't know where that will be, but that's my gut. Yep. Charles? Um, <coughs> so without going into too much depth, but, uh, 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 deep interest of mine is uh, social network analysis. And one of the things that you see is that as you create a more connected network, you end up increasing this thing called homophily, which is basically birds of a feather flock together. And that's exactly what you see on Facebook at the moment. And you create these echo chambers, and it doesn't really matter then in that echo chamber whether there is truth or not. And that's as a consequence of creating this interconnectedness. Um, and it's something that needs to be thought about quite carefully. Um, and that is the evolution of any of that they've done these studies in many places looking at um, home ownership, you know, what happens racially within a, a specific area and what tends to happen is that things evolve towards a segregated environment, unfortunately. Um, and that is just that, that, that you can do this with statistical models and you see this time and time and time again just based on slight um, biases that people expect. So can I just ask a question? Yeah. Actually, are you saying that, sort of, that it's almost an inherent quality of people with yeah. these things in the, yeah. and technology just allowing us to see it more easily? And, and, and it's facilitated. It's always yeah. And amplifying it. And I think it was also a discussion that I'm going to leave with you now. Um, at the US Congress, they, they were actually talking about this because the big <coughs> they actually talked about Trump the election and everything. And in fact, the scary thing is you think about AI machine learning, deep learning, where you can have videos where they could put words in your mouth um, and yeah. it's not you saying that. And it's, it, well, it's a danger. And it looks authentic. Um, so traceability stuff that you talked about, how do we address those type of things as well? Because you think it's real, but it's not real. And it can, it's easy to fool a human, <laughs> easy. So um, so we've got so many big problems to, to crack in terms of that, but anyway. Yeah, Selena, then. Okay. Yeah, I mean, this is kind of the, so I'm Selena, I work with Megan at Exio, um, and helping with the competition platform that she mentioned. Um, the flip side of this, I mean, talking about uh, 
you know, the way AI is going to disrupt our lives and the way we get information, all of these things. I mean, I think part of the story is also that this is still in reality affecting only a certain segment of the population, particularly in South Africa or Africa more broadly. And I mean, AI runs on data. And I'm wondering what the panel thinks about how far are we to the point where an average person is actually disrupted, their life is actually disrupted by AI. Um, and this push for AI, is there a chance that if we let it go the way it wants to go, will it actually create a bigger gap um, where only certain people who have data-rich lives, who need data-rich lives, are actually benefiting from AI? That's a good question. There's a good case study in China that so, um, <coughs> with any pay and they create scoring, but yeah, it's basically exclusionary. I mean, it's, it really, really is. I think also, right, you know, your credit scores also linked to your friends or things like that. So it's just a quick case study, but it's very, very worrying. And I think that as you know, the people creating a lot of the tech, we need to start really thinking of like all of the applications and what are we actually getting involved in when we when we do this. Yeah, yeah. I agree, and, and just to expand on that and to answer, I think the question that you asked in the beginning, um, I, I can recommend this white paper that they've written in India which looks at a lot of these complexities and tries to balance the, the benefits that you can, you can get from AI with the costs, both at the individual level and at the country level, and at all of these things. So it's, it's well worth reading through that. Um, I think you could probably yeah, find please it. Please share. I'll you can share. find it. If you share, uh, well, what I will do is buy the Machine Intelligence Africa Org website. I'll share the presentations. I think you've got a presentation as well, if you want to. Uh, but we'll, we can share these kind of links so you can get it. Um, any further, there was a question there, and then Michael, yes, well, uh, introduce yourself then. Andy, Andy. Andy, Andy. yeah. Um, the trust thing is a big one. Um, yeah. So we, we're just getting more and more information. We have to try and compartmentalize it because we can't deal with the, the volume. We don't know whether we can trust it or not, so we're falling back into these simplification states. Um, Hashgraph won't work, unfortunately. Not Hashgraph, sorry. Um, it uh, uh, seems far too much resource. Won't, won't, yeah. <laughs> it, it's ridiculous. And also, you, you actually don't know until about an hour in after six blocks that that set of blocks is going to stay on the blockchain. So it's a probability as to whether or not it's not going to work for micro transactions. Hashgraph is a better system. Uh, Lehman Bag, Swirls, you can look at it yourself. It's a much lower power system and is, is certain. Um, I think that we might be. I've been involved in computers since I was like 11, 11 years old, programming machine code games on PEP 2002 series stuff, and I didn't even did a degree in it or the rest of it. Um, I think we might be deluding ourselves into thinking that we can be part of this future of the end. I think essentially we're creating new intelligence, if you like. Um, to think that we would be in control of the AI is like us thinking that an abacus would be controlling a super. Unless we augment ourselves. Um, Elon Musk. Well, yeah, I mean, <laughs> unless we augment ourselves, we're not going to keep up with this space. So, so we, we're going to have to, I think we're going to end up in a system where the AIs are running it, basically. We kind of have to trust the AIs. And maybe that's what happens, because we can't trust people to do it. That's why we have the election systems. So maybe we're, we're going to move to a system where we trust the AIs to, to look after us, as long as they're not at war as well, and trying to fight each other. Um, but why would the AIs keep us around? You know, the, the history is that the most intelligent animal basically proliferates and the rest just die off. So, you know, maybe the, this brain here isn't actually, isn't going to be the most competent thing on the planet. Um, and we see, sorry, to, to the Industrial Revolution thing, that's going to be happening in shorter and shorter periods. So in a lifetime, yes, but we're going to, I mean, the, 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 the advent of um, quantum computers, the speed at which that's going to change, and then the speed of, of, of acceleration you're going to see, it's just going to outstrip our ability. Back to the abacus again, thinking it's in control of this thing, it's just, I just don't think it's going to happen. So, so I think we have to kind of accept the fact that, that we're essentially creating the next generation. Maybe we can be part of that. Maybe we can somehow put our consciousness in into that space. We're yep. going to move away from this as the mechanism. Yep. And if it comes back, there's obviously an assumption that we can create conscious views, effectively. 
or and sure. yeah, so so one needs to be uh, if it's you can still have we already have super intelligence around us in a very narrow way yeah but it's, but but even if you get more okay, so it's going to be very interesting this is how we need to shape it because i think technology should serve us you know, as much as possible but it's but but it's there's maybe all part of that transition so the danger is you can potentially create a human brain or, or a, a kind of more complex type of intelligence uh, that could be conscious and then you've got interesting stuff. All the stuff that you said is, is relevant. Because the level of yeah. employment of intelligence that you're going to need for it to be employable is yeah. just rising. True. So unless we have a system of universal basic income, which yeah. is going to look after <clears throat> and essentially totally defocus, yeah. you know, we, we won't be doing this rope running stuff, but it will be more about things which, which make us feel better. You know, we understand each other a lot more. We've got time for that. But, but, but what product, What do we do productively in that yep. environment? So why would they keep us around? So, that's a, that's a, that's a kind of, so you really are doing, tapping into some quite important philosophical conversations yeah, and, and it's around the meaning of life for, for human beings. And there is a high believe high probability that work. We, we always grew up believing that work was our meaning. That's where we got meaning. And we may need to recalibrate our thinking around what, what is meaning and what is our purpose. And that's going to be, uh, that has massive social implications because we've, we've been, I, I was brought up in a world in which I, I looked about after me and then maybe one or two circles around me and it was very much around that. And, 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 and in future we may need to be having a far more systemic view around how we're tapping into everything. <laughs> And how we are really influencing everything, and, 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 and that's a high level view, and, and that we don't go with it. But then, what do we do? And, I, and AI is going to ask some very serious questions. The challenge is if those control mechanisms are that technology, the means of production, um, and, and that's starting to get into fewer and fewer people's hands, what are the implications of that? Or do we have the philosopher king's model again? Um, or, or how do we handle this, this, this new emerging, and it, the challenge is it's moving quite quickly, and I'm not necessarily sure that we are able to socially uh, ad uh, adjust quick enough without, as I was saying, that, that traumatic transition, yeah. which often cr creates the, the break and then the yeah. move. Um, and, and I don't know if this is an incremental possibility. I think there's going to be a break, and there could be a significant something that happens uh, linked to a war, linked to something that's going to fundamentally break systems and, and something else has to emerge. And, and, and I think it's a possibility, a real possibility. If the companies just end up just taking out more and more people, you're just going to get a complete disenfranchised set of people. So you, they are going to have to have some sort of resource access, otherwise they're going to re there's going to be a revolution in that space. I think it's a whole big discussion just on that. Yeah. Do you maybe, maybe want to say something about, because I would love to go into more detail there, there's more to say there, but Michael's got a question, and I think you've got a question as well, and, and I, Camilla, we've got about five minutes, yeah, because sure. you want to, I, do, do you have a little bit more? excuse myself. No, that's um, fine. Please carry Okay, good, so it's fine, but, but do the coffee is really there. I've made fresh coffee and tea, and there's a few muffins left. Muffin. Okay, awesome. Okay, good. Thanks, Camilla. Okay, so let's quickly, that's it. Michael first. Um, yes. Hey guys, um, Michael Stanley from um, so I, this taps a little bit into what Ryan was saying earlier and very much in line with this conversation to say if we allow society to just continue in a natural way, you know, we can talk about the big companies harboring all stuff, but at the end of the day they're driven by users and users will dictate how the world goes forward. Ironically, even if I was a customer service representative, I would desperately not want to speak to another customer service representative from another country and far on the using AI. Let's say if we had Alexa and she could sort out our problems. I'd far rather work with her because I know that the current experience is completely broken. I'm feeling better about this now because I've been weeks in the process. If I could speak to an AI, I would choose to speak to one. Like I know at the moment bots have some problems, but we realize it will get better and that we'll be able to solve my problem very quickly. So I, as a user, will dictate that that big company should use bots rather than even have augmented humans. I'd far rather have bots because they are faster and always available. So that says, I, I, I love the idea of the augmentation thing, but, but necessarily we're going to have to have a guiding hand. And we'll have to have a source of truth that tells us either a government that says you need to employ X number of human beings at your revenue levels, or perhaps it'll be a more natural evolution to say it'll be corporate social responsibility, just in the way that I'll buy a more expensive free range because it's better for humanity. Maybe a company will be, their value proposition will be we employ humans, and as a result, you should work with us. 
and we know that there's big markets for that. But, but honestly, you know, rather than speak to bots and it's better, take the pain to speak to the human, but we, it's better for society. And I wonder if that'll be a natural evolution of saying, this is where employment comes from, and saying, we're the good guys, and you'll buy from us as a result. That's a good point, yeah. Awesome. Um, just one question, then another question, and then, then I chose you, you next. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm going to be medium, and I'll talk to you with everybody. That's good. Um, uh, my name's Lisa. I'm coming this, at this from a very non technical point of view. So I am in, uh, I'm a search consultant, I specialize in corporate communications. So my question, firstly, is from a human capital point of view. I know that there was a big summit in Joburg recently about AI in HR. Um, I wonder what the panel's kind of just top line thoughts on how AI is currently being used by, by bigger, or not just big organizations, but organizations in general, in terms, uh, from a human capital point of view, in terms of sourcing talent, retaining talent, nurturing talent, developing talent. Fantastic. I, I actually was at that presentation. I did a keynote address there, and the presentation is on the Machine Intelligent Africa website. Okay. Unfortunately, we didn't do a video of that, but the presentation is there with some rich content around this. I also have one of the companies in the Cortex Logic uh, portfolio is called the Talent Index. It's an AI platform for human capital valuation. Working with Alexander Forbes, running that out countrywide, almost 2,000 customers. Working very specifically with corporates as well. Looking at life cycle, employee life cycles, um, uh, resignation risk. Uh, bringing in all sorts of different things in their helpers, all sorts of different things. So there are active work being done um, on, on, on that. So there's, there's some rich information there. But there's also quite a bit of startups, other companies looking at various aspects of uh, recruitment. You see all these kind of apps coming to the fore. So, and I've actually in that presentation listed a range of that as well. So, yeah, and I also, I was just yeah. saying, what I find interesting is that the AI, the AI that is being adopted is optimization. <coughs> Yeah, so it is allowing you to, to find uh, candidates uh, quicker, match them easier, have digital conversations where facial recognition is actually working out already personality and doing a whole lot of interpretive stuff. The, the, the bottom line though is we just, we are optimizing an old model, which is I'm still looking for an individual to do a job. So what I, I kind of have a counter view is to say, Oh, let's start with the end in mind. What is that job? What is this human being needing to do? And, and uh, uh, you know, you could find them perfectly. They still arrive and they ask to do mechanistic uh, roles, which is going to kill them. <laughs> Can't we start with that and use AI to stop them having to do that? Then find the right people to add, you know, look at the right brain, look at other behavioral uh, components that then shape who we place in what role. And so that was just my, my take on it. Is that, AI is currently being used largely to optimize a current model. Yeah. And I, I'm pushing it to say it is actually transformational. We have, to cons we have to look at this in a transformational light and say fundamentally the human role changes. How do we now apply AI? And, and that's my opinion. And also the other problem is like a lot of the things in HR are just perpetuating these biases <laughs> and these bad, like bad recruiting, you know, because exactly. of the model that you're building, you know, yeah. how you build it. Josie, you want to maybe react and then? Yeah, I mean, I, mean, I, would, I would agree with what you guys are saying. I'm not as familiar with HR. I've, I've heard that there are models. But, um, the one thing I did just want to say, though, is just go back one conversation that Ryan was alluding to, is that there's there's a lot of echoes of, I don't know if, if anyone here has read Thomas Piketty's um, Capital, which was basically the, the disconnect between the price of labor and the return on labor and return on capital and how that's been. And um, that that generally gets reset by a war, um, and the Second World War was the last one that reset that, and that was basically the reason for um, a fairly wealthy uh, sort of 60s and 70s generation, as compared to now, where there's much more strain on uh, labour income, um, and, and there's probably a similar thing happening with AI and holding AI, so uh, and who holds the data, and that the return on data is going to increase much faster than. No, that's an excellent point. Question. Okay. Sorry, I'm AJ. I work as a bank practitioner. So actually, I'm just kind of interested more in the machine learning and the data science. Yep. But uh, based on my experience on the aspect of the machine learning and the AI So currently, we're working on the MIPT, which is like non-invasive and data testing. So what really happened is 
most times the patient will go to the to, to the doctor and the pregnant woman has a heavy pregnancy and the maybe the pregnant woman is having a kind of problem with the with the baby. So the doctor will find out like a, take the blood sample and try to say, okay, we want to find out whether your baby is actually having a kind of a particular genetic disease. So for them to be able to carry out, the doctor doesn't really understand the technology. So what we do is uh, we take the blood sample of the patient and we send it to the lab. Then we do some kind of sequencing, which is which comes back to the gene of the and then the sequencing have to turn the block have to generate to the DNA kind of just for the human understanding. So we have the ATG, whatever the DNA sequence. Then specifically what I'm, I'm kind of interested in that we have some a bunch of developers in the United States and in the time. So what they do is they have their own machine learning kind of algorithm in their design that when we do the sequencing, they will send a the the, 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 uh, the sample that we do the sequencing, we send it on the cloud. Then we now use that to test for the <coughs> Down syndrome or a monosomy kind of a disease on that kind of a baby. Then the result will come back and say, okay, whether it's positive or it's negative. So now my worry was that uh, this patient doesn't really know about the technology. The doctor doesn't really know about the technology. Then we base our judgment based on the results on whether it's positive, which is high risk, or it's low risk, which is negative. Then we, when we give back the results to NASA, which is the pathology, then they make a judgment and give the results back to the doctor. But at the end, the question is just goes back to the data we generate. We have the data sitting here in the South Africa. But also, we upload, each day we upload up to less than 14 gig of data every day to the cloud. Now, that comes back to me that how we actually, the policy in terms of like, how we maintain the data. In other words, because I do ask the question that, okay, when we send this data to the cloud, how we kind of like, in terms of marketing, are you not using our data to market this thing? Or, okay, I do know that, okay, any single mistake I make when I'm doing my, when I'm carrying out the computation, Maybe, maybe I just change one of the letter, then can, that can be an effect where the patient can be like, it can come back as a result of negative. Then, human, we don't trust the system. Somehow, we still need the professional of the clinical genesis that needs to sit down and give a proper result. It's okay, yes, we make a call, but then we still need you to verify in terms of like giving the results to the patient. We, we, do, we, can't, we can trust the technology in terms of the what the result comes in, machinery discover, detect everything, giving us an accuracy of 99%, but then we can't 100% still put our trust and say, okay, this is it, but then we need a clinical genesis to be able to make a call. So, okay, this is the result, then based on what we study, based on research, this is what we give out to the doctor and then we give it to the patient. So, in a, in a way, Technology is kind of saving life, which is this aspect of the AI and the machine learning. Because I could see where the application is kind of being used. But in Africa, we don't really have the expertise in terms of like people actually trying, in, even in the aspect of data science, even currently in South Africa, the bioinformatics field is very long. It's though it's trying to come up. People talk about data science, people talk about machine learning, but really we're not looking at X sector of which there's so much in the X sector that we know really, we just don't yeah. know that when it comes to cancer research, in terms of like when we have to do the post cancer for the men of Africa, we don't really know much about what is going on. Then this whole technology can actually be implemented in this area yeah. of then at the end we have more results in Africa. But uh, so fantastic. Um, what's your name again? Say again your name. Uh, AG. AG. So we need to connect because the good news is we've got actually we're addressing that problem. So so uh, from a Cortex side, we work with Professor Wilson Slanga, um, UCT. Where are you located? Yeah, I work with uh, Professor Ale. Where? where? Uh, I'm actually working on the 
CPGR. Uh, CPGR, Dr. Ryan Hiller. Yeah. Are you part of, okay, so we are working with him as well. So we're looking at CPGR Artisan Biomed. Yeah. Are you working with that? Yep. So they are part of this. Um, Muslim Slonga as well. We're working with Next Biosciences. And we're doing, uh, we're talking about this, putting the AI, the domain expertise, the sequencing, um, and the, 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 the whole system to, to, to market in place. So it's kind of a um, joint venture. Um, so we are working with that. And not only that, the South African Medical Research Council, which is working with the Beijing Genome Institute, Microsoft in terms of the Azure. So, so there's a bunch of stuff happening actively on that. And locally, all the expertise, AI, data science, genomics, okay, with Professor Musam Slonga, he's focused on oncology. So we're looking at that. But uh, so we're already working with Ryan Taylor, so I've spent some time with CPGR, so, so that's awesome. I mean, it's a concern for me because I feel like, yeah, we do have a lot of, uh, like, the academic education we have people. And then we have to have a lot of knowledge. I agree. Because so that's a gap. Really because when we look at Africa correctly, I still feel like there's so much gaps in Africa. Uh, absolutely. The that's the opportunity. The so there's so, just so much opportunity that we can actually create. And at the end, outsider, which is whatever, they can tap into the knowledge that we're actually creating the domain here. Yeah. That would be really I'm, I'm so much behind that, and for me, if you think about Africa, education is very important, financial inclusion, you know, you were involved in before as well, healthcare is so important, so so we are very actively focused on that, and networking together all the critical resources, and, and the whole, looking at the whole ecosystem, also all the universities, so there's discussion with UCT, Stanford, BITS, talking about all the hospitals as well, um, and trying to link it all up. Um, yeah, so the healthcare information exchange, there's so many discussions going on in government. So a lot of moving parts, it's tricky. You need visionary leadership to, put, to make it work and um, stuff, but, but there are th things happening in that regard. But it's a very valid point. Okay, so uh, just quickly, any further comments, questions, because um, I think it's, we've got seven minutes. Um, so we probably want to network. So if there's any questions, so let's take a last question and then we can talk. They had the coffee and the muffins and stuff. We continue the discussion. I said one extra comment. Yes. About, so we can have all the um, all the technical ability we want, but if we're behind on the data set, what use is that? So our first thing we need to <coughs> sort out is collaborative and inventive, like you said, um, open data sets that, or maybe not fully open, but manage like. At the moment, they're fragmented. There's not, there's not a, a, point, a source. Um, for example, and, and, and things where we're so behind, where we need to sort out before we get to machine learning, like infrastructure, transport infrastructure. Um, I mean, that has a big impact on um, inclusion of um, different races, etc. If, if, if rich people have cars and can get anywhere like that, poor people don't have public transport in this country, um, then, yeah, so those sort of problems need to be sorted out first, uh, and, and if we can actually capture all the, the data that comes through a working system like that, then we can actually use AI to make it a smart technology, but if we're on the back foot, there's definitely, like I said, gaps. Massive gaps. Africa, we, we are almost forced to need to get government on board to do any of this because the private sector doesn't have the capabilities to coordinate this stuff. Absolutely. We, we all need to work together. Even from a Cortex side, we're always thinking about creating those smart data layers. You can't do even apply AI properly if you haven't got those the infrastructure sort of So the infrastructure is very for us very important part of an end-to-end -end solution. So got to sort that out. And with regards to healthcare, we're looking at a healthcare data platform for Africa as well. We've got proper data covenant, governance, privacy by design, everything built in. Um, and you can create your app store, you create this multi-sided platform ecosystem uh, really around this. So this is the potential. And then, um, we, we, uh, as Africans, we control that better. Um, and uh, so, so I think that's what we work with. But that's infrastructure. So. Yeah, just, just one thing on the data sets. I think what would go a long way towards making more data sets available is a clearer regulatory framework on how data can be released um, and done in an ethical way. Um, at the moment, there's a very little guidance on that, so I don't blame private companies for not releasing those data, just the, the doubt that 
the, the spiritual upside for them and just massive downside. But are, are there groups that are putting pressure on the government to kind of, I don't know, collaborate with them? <laughs> so, so one group that, that I've been, so, so for example, um, mobile phone data could be very useful, right? You could use that for a number of things. There's no upside for a mobile phone company at this point to release those data. Um, there's an organization called DAO, Digital Impact Alliance, and they're trying to create a business case that actually makes it um, uh, feasible for mobile network companies to release those data under whatever, some, whatever conditions they might be in their bunch of different licenses. But part of that is going to have to be the government buying into it and saying, yes, we think under such and such a regulatory framework, these data can be made for the common good. But without that, there's uh, you know, there's no way a mobile phone network is gonna release those data, they're just gonna get should there be pressure urge to or do you think it's their right to withhold it? But they can't release it at the moment because it's personal information. So Yeah, but there are ways of withholding it. So those are not. The, so you have to. So there was an orange uh, data set that was released in Senegal, and there were a number of um, concerns raised about. And those were anonymized data. There were a number of concerns raised by people about the fact <coughs> that you could actually identify people. For example, in a small village, there might only be like five people that have a cell phone. So if you can geolocate those people, then you can find that person, and then you can unravel all of this anonymization. So there needs, uh, like maybe the. Death. Maybe that is a problem, maybe that isn't. That's a discussion that people need to have. But without that discussion, like, you know, the mobile phone company, which is the one I'm using as an example, is never going to release those data because they're just going to get nailed. If I can jump in, yeah. we've actually just built a data science program for the African Leadership University of Mauritius. Um, and it's like this industrial internet program to teach African data science and like with quite a strong IoT angle, but we really struggle with data sets. So, so it's like how do you teach like this, uh, create this program? But it's just one of it. I mean, some of it we called it data masking. So we basically take like <laughs> these overseas data sets and create like African problems around them for case studies and things like that. But really, health data, you know, and we wanted like a lot of different industries that it was extremely difficult. I mean, it wasn't. Biggest challenge was data, not even creating all the coding. Yeah. I mean, that is the problem because I also imagine like you finding the disease, you know, you're not looking at after or you're looking at outside and trying to make what is outside and trying to justify yeah. that or give an answer that this is how. I mean, it doesn't make sense. No, I agree with you. If I'm from other Africa, from I'm from yeah. Nigeria. I should be able to have my own genome sequence in such a way that when I'm finding my disease, I should be able to look at my own data Absolutely. and then make an inference on them, not yeah. outside and say, okay, because I'm black, uh, let's look at black America. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, where's all the Nigerians and black Americans? <laughs> no, I'm, I'm with you there, 100%. So I think hopefully we're going to address that. But that's the opportunities that we've got here. And we need to move quickly because it's... Uh, anyway, I think... Uh, <laughs> I just wanted to conclude, but there's another question. <laughs> yes, now so go for it, go for it. I'm a Bendesa. Yes, again? A Bendesa. Yes, and, Bendesa. Um, I'm here actually to uh, learn about the impact of AI on cybersecurity. Oh yes, very important area. And, um, we should talk afterwards as well. Yeah. Yeah. Something that I mean, I've, I've had great ideas here and uh, it's, it's, it's my glory. But um, you can just touch on areas um, like using machine learning, you know, to, to uh, model uh, network behaviors and um, have some proof threat detection. You know, you can just think around that. Uh, I, I, that's such an important <laughs> like, it's a big topic at the US Congress. Um, they talked about cyber, obviously cyber security is massive. The new we talk about war and stuff, and, but, but really that's a big area of that one needs to, that's but where is big application for AI. So we are also working with PwC on a cyber security vulnerability management as a service type of solutions and stuff. Um, and that, that's a huge area. Um, and you need to combat things. Um, it's also some of the biggest the pitfalls, the areas of concern. Um, and that one with the suicide. Um, big, big 
cyber, if you think about data privacy, but you've got cyber security, you've got very smart systems that can just hack into your system to create havoc. Um, you can crash sy systems. Um, so it's, it's such an important area of the security. It's a big, massive bit. So, so we've got a work cut out. <laughs> so I don't know. I don't know if you've got comments. I see there's a question at the back. Any comments on that? Oh, yeah, I think let's take it to coffee. Yeah. Go. Let's take it to coffee. <laughs> One question, coffee. Because it's 12 o'clock. I don't know. Is the PwC stuff just in the research phase or is it actual? No, they, they're providing currently manual services to companies and stuff yeah. uh, around vulnerability management as a service. And so it's still in discussions. So, yeah. So we haven't implemented anything yet. And the work we do with boards? But it's on a fault. Yeah, we've got a system, uh, an actual system that's working and everything and evolving that. Yeah. yeah and then do they, do you guys do the development? Yeah, we do, the, no, we do everything. Yeah. Okay. Great. Okay. Great. Thank you very much. Coffee, <laughs> leg tea, let's continue the discussion there. I'm just going to switch off this thing. <laughs> right. Yes, man. Yes. I'm not meeting.